it's my favourite plant at this time of year, Dacer Aconite Folio, um, yeah. which is just the most magical plant at York at the minute. I was terribly inspired by York Gate. One of the ideas that I came home and, and actually uh, copied, <laughs> I stole it. I stole an idea from York Gate, and that was to plant um, the weeping uh, grey cedar um, on a wall. The planting in general consists of plants that you don't usually see. So there's out coming about York Gate. <laughs> <laughs> you practised that one. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Talking Dirty episode 16. Over at East Ruston Old Vicarage, looking oh so awesome in orange, is Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and extremely handsome horticulturalist. You old flatterer. <laughs> <laughs> and then over in Cambridgeshire, we have Thordis, Maria Sophia Fridrikson, in all her glory. This terribly, it's such a coincidence going on this morning because friend of mine, Matt, arrived this morning and he suddenly said he'd been painting one of the rooms in his house, the most beautiful duck egg blue, and look at the background on, in your room. I try. <laughs> <laughs> took a long time to get the shade right, so I'm glad you noticed. And joining us for the first time on the podcast is a lady we've actually talked about several times because she is an inspiring gardener. She has an amazing Instagram account. Uh, she's also a textile artist, a real plants woman, Jane Ann Walton. Welcome to Talking Dirty. Hello. <laughs> Middle names then. So we've got Jane hyphen Anne. Anything else to add? My mother couldn't make her mind up. I think that's why I'm Jane hyphenated Anne. She also called, my first name is actually Jacqueline. No one watches this podcast or listens to it, right? Because I don't want anyone to know that. <laughs> I, I think um, it was all to do with the fact I was bald when I was a baby and my hair didn't grow for a long time. When it did grow, it was patently obvious it wasn't going to be dark. And in my mother's childhood times, dolls all had dark hair and her dolls are all called Jacqueline. So when the hair grew, she said, can't call her Jacqueline because she hasn't got dark hair. So that was... Fortunately for me, Jacqueline went in the bin, and uh, that's the story. <laughs> All the J's. We've got fabulous hair now. <laughs> <laughs> At least I'm not bald again yet. <laughs> well, you made up for it in later life with the fabulous yeah. head of hair. Now, Alan and I have been lucky enough to come and see particularly your auriculars. Anyone who knows you, anyone who follows you on Instagram will probably associate you oh with auriculars and snowdrops. Um, and yeah, hey presto, a wonderful auricular to bring to the party. Yeah, I found just a couple that were flowering out of season. So that's um, a border auricular called Eden Fanfare. And it's a nice frilly one. Several of your auriculars I think have headed Alan's way. <laughs> so how many do you have? <laughs> Don't ask Alan whether they're still alive. Yes, they really are still alive. I well haven't been them yet. <laughs> Tut. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I've probably got between five and seven hundred plants at the moment and I repotted them all in July at the moment you get these yellow leaves as the day is shorten and the weather cools get yellow leaves so every week or so just go around and um, pull them off and then they look much nicer and in an ideal winter, which for an auricular is a cold winter, it goes right down to just the little bit in the middle. Um, and then they flower really well the next year. And the problem we've had lately is that we're having much milder winters and they don't flower as well. A lot of them, the cultivars, I haven't seen flowers on them for quite a few years because they're just having too good a life, really. So it's quite annoying. When does your love affair with auriculars start? Oh, uh, seeing them at Chelsea Flower Show on the late Brenda Hyatt stand and seeing them, they, she used to display them as many people did with, against a black background with a lovely gold frame round. And the one that I fell in love with was the green one, Prague. And I just thought, gosh, you know, they just look so exotic, don't they? And you know how it is, you just get one or two and then you think, oh, I'll get a few more. And Yeah. <laughs> But that many hundred, I mean, that is a huge job, I would imagine, at the time of year when you need to, to devote attention to them. That must be so time consuming. This, this year, I was repotting them solidly, I think, for 10 days in July when I should have been on holiday, but I couldn't go. So I thought, well, OK, I'll get it done. It's earlier than I normally do it. 
that they were full of root aphids, which are an absolute nightmare to auricular growers now. And you have to wash all the roots really carefully, brush all the aphids say, off. Jane Ann, um, for, for people that want to or are starting to grow auriculars, mm. um, I was just going to say, and you just have actually, what do you do about root, um, root aphids? I mean, when you say wash the roots, do you wash them in plain water or do you use an additive? Well, I think they've got a little waxy coating, a bit like a mealy bug that you need yep. to get off. You can. So I start off by knocking them out of the pot, tapping the soil off. Then I dunk them in a bucket of um, sort of eco washing up liquid, which and water, which I hope will like break down that waxy coating. Then I take them over to the sink and you should really do it under a running tap because they're quite, you know, they cling on quite tight. And yeah. I was told to use a horse's face brush. Now I've never quite worked out what texture that is, but I've got a brush that I use for chalk painting and things. I use that. It's, you know, medium firmness and brush yeah. all the, the auriculars don't like it very much, but they survive. And then I take them back to my workbench and dip them in neem oil in solution, which whether it's going to work, I don't know, but and then, of course, you've got to be really scrupulous in the pot washing, which is a right pain. <laughs> and I think that the root aphids are much worse if you grow in clay pots, which is a shame because I like to grow in clay pots. But I'm now going over to growing them all in plastic. And then when I put them in theatres, I'll plunge the pot inside a bigger terracotta pot. So it looks like they're in terracotta. Where do they all live when they're you know not doing their thing when they're not showy do you have uh, an auricular area i do i've got around the back of the garage north facing which is good because um you know the, the temperature is fairly even there they are around there and there's like it's like a little market stall with a little clear roof sloping so that the worst of the rain doesn't get in it's not ideal for the show auriculars because the rain does blow in if you get get it coming from certain directions but it makes for lower maintenance than if I had them in a greenhouse and I don't have a greenhouse and I don't really want the hassle of a greenhouse because things are really in intensive care then, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is I think about a greenhouse, Jane Ann, is if you have a greenhouse, the fatality in your life is that you fill it. Yes, um, absolutely. And however big it is, it's never big enough. No, I know. And it just creates more work. Yeah, and then you need another greenhouse and another one. And <laughs> it goes on. <laughs> exactly. So, so out of interest, just because I always avidly follow all of your propagation, just to move away from auriculars and onto yeah. other plants, where do you grow all of the amazing cut flowers and things that you grow from seed? They are mostly in my vegetable patch because I feel that the cut flowers bring more joy than the cabbages really. Um, so <laughs> vegetable wise, I grow new potatoes, which I find fairly foolproof, uh, climbing beans, salad, veg, and I'm not really doing much else now. And I just, you know, I have far too many cut flowers really, but I just love them. Well, I'm fairly certain some of those will make an appearance in your show and tell in just a moment, but yes, before, I'm all over the floor. <laughs> before we get onto all of that, um, so we've had one auricular for show and tell. The other mm -hmm. thing I mentioned that people probably know you for is your amazing snowdrops. There you Look go. At those. <laughs> so you can have snowdrops for uh, five months a year, start in October, last ones finish about the end of April. Um, these ones are, the top one is a Galanthus L. Wessii, which is from Turkey, I believe. This one is actually from Mike Broadhurst in Suffolk, and it's called Rainbow Farm Early. Um, this is Regini Olgai, after Queen Olga of Greece. Um, that one is Eleni, I think, and that one's Sophia, or it might be the other way around, because they do all look much the same at this time of year. I think the more interesting markings tend to happen sort of Christmas onwards and they've got a lovely scent real sweet honey scent the trouble with the autumn ones is they if the weather's like this they are very prone to slug damage so I don't grow too many of them and I know every time I've been to see you recently you keep meaning to go and look to see whether yours are in flower have you popped around to see your I never know how to say I did. it Regine Olge Regine Olge yeah. <laughs> Regine Olge yeah I mean I went um, I think was with Graham the other day, Saturday I think it was, and we found one, one just about to, it was just, 
you know, the 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 flower was still upright. It hadn't. Yes. Um, its pedestal hadn't developed. Yeah. So yes, it, they're starting. At the moment, we're busy. Um, I'm cutting down the Helleborus orientalis leaves because I want to get the beds ready for the snowdrops, really. So we're cutting all those off. I'm feeding it all with fish blood and bone and getting a really good mulch of homemade leaf mould. Because if you leave it too late, the snowdrops tend to come up and they sit with their growing tips just under the surface. And if you leave it too late to put that mulch on, they get etiolated. They come up all sort of yellow and distorted. Um, which isn't a good look, so you need to do it ASAP. Unless you want really. to try and pretend that's a new variety and flog it for hundreds of pounds. Yeah, it's known as a cow pat yellow. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say I was very lucky in that um, Jane Ann brought me um, a crate of snowdrops that I'd ordered from her the other day in the garden, and they're still in their, in their pot, but they have a designated new area. Um, and I'm just waiting for the tree fellas to come in and take um, a rather old, I think I told you, Jane Ann, rather old Polonia tomentosa out, um, which is far too much ivy and casting too much shade, um, so that we're going to make it a dappled area. But in that area, one of the beds I completely covered the other day with a one single heap that we'd made of leaf, leaf mould. So I've got yes. my mulch there already, if you like. Lovely. Um, Very good. And I just hope we're going to do really well in there. They'll like that. So how old was your Balonia, do you know? I, I grew it from seed probably more than 20 years ago. They grow very fast. And ugly. And, they and ugly and bits snap off all the time, don't they? Yes, they do. Um, we've got one that's a relatively young tree, which is a variety called Polonia Blue, out in the East Park. And that has made the most amazing tree. And so <laughs> far, it's only about seven or eight years old. But so far, I mean, it's full of blossom. It blooms much earlier than the ordinary Tomentosa. <laughs> bigger flowers, and so far it's behaving itself. It's retaining a, a good shape. Well, I must look out for that one. That might yeah, be, please do. Mine, I'm, I'm fond of mine because I grew it from seed I picked up in Beth Chateau's garden. <laughs> uh, but it just looks so ugly now. And yeah. uh, I thought, right, you've got to go. And I was all ready to phone the tree surgeon. And then I was telling you, I was filling a, a watering can and uh, a silver washed fritillary butterfly came and laid its eggs on the bark of the paulonia tree and they're really quite rare they come out of the woods and their their food plant is um wild violets and this paulonia has got a carpet of wild violets underneath and i just thought i i've got to leave that tree now just because it's got these <laughs> minuscule butterfly eggs on and i do hope that you know it will manage to produce some more butterflies next year it's rather interesting that thought because if you if you just think that if one person could have one thought about saving one species, one thing that they actually see happening, what a much better world it would be. Yeah, yeah. It's another thing people will know from your Instagram account is the amount of wildlife in your garden and in the surrounding area. You, you kind of almost as much post photos of critters and birds and things as you do the flowers. Yeah, we're, we're very lucky. We've got on the south side, Swanton Nova's Woods, which is a national nature reserve. It has um, restricted access. I think there are only 40 permit holders allowed in, but it's um, 210 acres and special site of special scientific interest and uh, just a fantastic area for wildflowers and lizards and badgers and all the rest of it. The deer are not always welcome. Badgers not always welcome, but I do love to see the badgers, really. The things I remember from your garden, as part from, I mean, I could go on for a long time, but there were two things that stick in my mind that are probably going to be interesting to people. And first of all was that a wonderful sort of pink and green flowered erythronium. Yeah, Joanna. Joanna, yes, that's right. Yeah. I mean, I, I've never seen an erythronium with quite that, that lovely colouring before. Yeah. And the other thing is, of course, the water meadows that were full of um, dactyl risers. Yes, and um, I've tried to spread the devil's bit scabious, and that looks wonderful now. Although my husband would disagree. He walks through his meadow and he says, this meadow's derelict, because all he wants to see is grass for his horses. <laughs> so we have a little bit of um, friction over the breakfast table, over the management of the meadows, but he doesn't know. But I quietly go round picking the seed heads off the scabious and just scattering it so I can get a bigger and bigger area each year. <laughs> you, sound, you sound exactly like Miss Wilmot from Wally yeah. Place in Essex because she used to do that. But I'm yeah. just saying, next time you have a contretemps with the hubby over the breakfast table, just turn to him and say, darling, life's a series of compromises. Yes. 
I'll remember that, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Funny, Alan, that you remembered the water meadows because it was my standout sentence from when we went for a walk around your garden together. Uh, wonderful day. Chauffeur driven by Alan Gray to Jane Ann Walton's garden. I mean, yes. that was a day to remember. <laughs> yeah, and you, special car. <laughs> you were giving us a tour and you um, you said that the, the orchid seed drifted in on the, the breeze from the water meadow. And I just thought that is a life goal right there to be able to say that wild orchid seed drifted into my garden yeah. on a breeze from the water meadow. It's true. The bad though is the, the dandelions they drift into. <laughs> and I really hate dandelions in my lawn. And I spend most of lockdown on my hands and knees crawling round and round, digging out dandelions day after day. You know, thought I'd got them all, then more yellow flowers appear. And I know we're meant to leave them for the wildlife, but there are plenty around and I've got plenty of other flowers and I just do not like them. I think probably dandelions are one of the plants that benefit most of all from having the roadside banks sheared because, um, uh, you know, around us we have lots of, um, well, I think it's, it's known as Alexander's or locally it was called bunk. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. an angelica relative and I mean that's become over the last 30 years that's become much more prevalent because of the mild winters which you were relating to your auriculars a little while ago yeah and so the climate has definitely changed but I've noticed that where the banks are shaved dandelions proliferate I mean it's, it's a very cheery sight when you're driving through the countryside in late March early April just to see this the banks of the road like sunshine it's lovely but I don't yeah. want them on my lawn <laughs> No, no. I felt a real idiot doing it because I thought this is so labour intensive. But then I was watching a um, Instagram video from Arnie Maynard and he said he'd been spending all yesterday digging dandelions out of his wildflower area. In fact, he doesn't like them there either. Um, so I thought, well, if Arnie does it, it's all right. You're in good, good company. <laughs> Now, talking of the fact that you have a lot of flowers for the pollinators, so you can be forgiven mm -hmm. for getting rid of dandelions, I think squirreled away around your screen, you've got various bits and bobs of shows. Yes, yes. Some of which are floral, some of which are not. These are out of my vegetable patch. And, oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> I was meeting a friend this morning who I haven't seen for a long time, and I picked these for her, but then... Um, I thought I'd better save them for the podcast. So sorry, <laughs> sorry, Kim, these are your flowers. <laughs> <laughs> so they're the last of the pink Noreen Bodeni eyes. Um, chrysanthemum Aloise pink, which I love, love the Aloise chrysanthemum. They've been flowering outside since August. Top tip with delphiniums is to cut them right to the ground when they finish flowering. And then you get another much more manageable crop to pick in now. Um, They've been really good this year. The rain did actually start at just the right time for them. So we haven't got mildew on the leaves and you get nice, small, much more manageable size ones. You know, the, the five foot ones aren't much use to me for cutting. Then we've got an ageratum and abelio, abelia phyllum, isn't it, um, Alan, I think? I think probably it is. All the abelias, I mean, are, are wonderful. They make lovely cut flowers because when the flower drops, it leaves behind that lovely little calyx. In your case, it's the That's calyx right. is green, Thank so you. it looks almost like a little green flower, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Your previous podcast with Ben, is it from York Gate? He was talking yeah. about his delphinium snapping. And I was wondering how he was staking them because... Mine, I grew from seed um, and I've got a big row of them and I always support them in the way that the RHS at Wisley did on their trial grounds, which is tubes of um, stock fencing. So that they're in this tube of fencing and they grow up and through them. So you, the fencing kind of disappears. When the wind blows, they just sway with that tube. Whereas what I used to do is do really smart, very labor intensive hazel supports. And it was useless because the first puff of wind, it blows the stem against the horizontal hazels and it just snaps off. But then I guess that at York Gate, you couldn't really get away with stock fencing because it's such a perfect garden. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. But in a way, if you get a solution to a problem, like you just said, I think, I think they could get away with it. Yeah. It does work. I've never yeah. had one snap in 30 years of growing them. That's clever. Yeah. Um, Alan, I think Jane Ann just stole your tip of the week. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one, isn't it? The white nareens, which I absolutely love. They flower just as the pink ones are going over. I think they're Bodenii alba, but 
they weren't named when I bought them. I found them in something called Plantsman's Corner at Bressingham years ago and bought, I suppose, six bulbs and they've increased to a nice row now, but it's taken a long time. And I do like having them in with blue. And this is that gorgeous Salvia Guanjuanito from Mexico. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, and the Eucomas seed heads. And by the time the they get those. The seed heads are great. They're almost nicer than the flowers, I think, because the flowers can be a bit pongy because horrible pollinated by flies. You also got that lovely little grass in there, which is... Yes. Panic and frosted explosion. Or... Panic, panic and frosted explosion, yeah. I think. It, uh, every year I think I'm not going to get it because it sort of self-seeds, but it's really, yeah. really late germinating, isn't it? It is. But I was just going to say, it's one of those plants, as are the new race of nerines that are um, coming onto the market for us all to buy today. It's one of those flowers that came to us through the cut flower industry because that, that um, panicum was grown um, as a filler um, by yeah. the cut flower people in Holland, and they used to send it over here. And if you think it's about lovely. it, that, that's how we got Ami Magus and Ami Bisnaga um, yeah. and other plants as well. It's quite fascinating that, you know, they come through the funny channel to get to a garden. Yes, that's yeah. right. This is, uh, the berries this year are just incredible, I think. I think you've, you've had Cali Carper on the podcast already. I don't really like red, so I like these these fancy ones. Clerodendron has these lovely turquoise. That's amazing. That is amazing. I don't think I don't think I've ever seen it so good, actually. Well, I, as I say, it's a fantastic year for berries. I mean, the slows in the hedges are incredible this yeah. year. Yeah. I always think the clerodendron, if you've never grown it, if you've never seen it, it, it looks like you've, you've just made it out of, you've modelled it out of clay or something. It doesn't <laughs> look like it can possibly be real. It's that turquoise, yeah. it's so unusual. That's right. Um, then we've got the yellow holly, which um, very shortly will be eaten by the red wings. I mean, this tree is absolutely covered this year. It's probably unlucky bringing holly in this time of year, isn't it? But never mind, forget that. We have a, a yellow buried holly that uh, Susan Andrews came and named, actually. She was, I think, on the Holly Committee at Wisley. And yeah. And she came and named it East Rust and Gold because it was a seedling that appeared in the garden here. And so we're rather thrilled about it. But haven't the holly berries been fantastic? Or well, aren't they fantastic? They have, yes. Uh, we had massive flocks of uh, field fairs and red wings coming over this last week. Um, and very soon, I think they'll descend on this. And the birds yeah. always eat the yellow buried holly before the red here. I don't know why. Because I think God. they eat differently, don't they? Yes. Uh, Jane Ann, have you ever seen the white buried holly? No. That's because there isn't one. <laughs> <laughs> you were so naughty. <laughs> well, no, but it is an oddity, isn't it? Because most, most plants have an, a version, an alba version. Um, with yes. either white, white flowers or white fruit, so, but there isn't a holly. I'm trying to grow the Iris Peterdissima, you know, that has the yes. winter. I'm trying to grow the white varied one of that, but whether well, it I've comes never found it. Well, I've, I've got some seed from, I think, a Cottage Garden Society seed exchange, so yeah. I thought it's worth a go. Yes, why not? Like... Anyway, and then uh, Viburnum tinus, again, the berries on that have been fantastic, and I love that sort of pearlescent look to the berries and normally I put this in my Christmas wreaths on the door but I very stupidly just had the door painted dark blue. <laughs> I can't do that anymore can I? <laughs> but it looks lovely with glaucous foliage you know with some uh, cedar foliage or something. Eucalyptus would be good. That's true so I cut it down I thought <laughs> it was before it fell down. Um, <laughs> This viburnum had the most terrible scale insect. I think, is it, is it uh, viburnum scale specific no. to mm -hmm. viburnums? I think it is. And I was going to cut it down to the ground yet again, but I left it. And fortunately, when we had all that massive amount of rain a few weeks ago, it's washed all the leaves clean again. Oh, that's good. So that's very nice. So it looks, you know, quite a nice shrub again. And then last but not least, we have Ampelopsis brevi pedunculares, which has the most gorgeous berries. That's uh, grown from seed given to me by Richard Hobbs some years ago. Do you, have, do you grow it, Alan? No, I don't. I grow something called Amp Ampelopsis brevi pedunculata um, variegated form, which is, has red stems, but it, 
the leaves are much smaller than your green ones. Ah, and do you get the berries on it? We do get the berries. It has, uh, they're smaller than those, um, maybe because this plant is more diminutive in itself as well. Um, but yes. we do get the berries, but they're more sort of turquoise purple than your purple ones. These are normally, yeah, the turquoise is the one I like best, and I've only got one at the moment. It's still yeah. quite early for it to be in berry. Yes, yeah. yeah. This is all I could find today, but I had a quick whiz round. Of course, on this podcast, we love to do a bit of FOMO, that FOMO you get about a plant you might have seen on Instagram or in a magazine, maybe even visiting someone else's garden, and you just desperately want to grow it, but you don't have it yet. Mine is, I suppose, unsurprisingly inspired by your Instagram, Jane Ann, at Jane underscore Ann, without an E, underscore Walton. I, uh, I had to go back through. I knew there were several things I wanted, and I had to go all the way back through it. Um, months back to see what one I particularly wanted to showcase and it's a muscari muscari camosum the tassel hyacinth yeah it is beautiful never really increases it's just grows in my gravel and um, hopefully is still there and hasn't been weed killed (laughs) it's extraordinary and when I first saw it it had this kind of almost candelabra quality to the the flower or certainly the flower I saw on your Instagram just yeah tell people about it because it's it when you say muscari it's not really what you would think this flower yeah it has the sort of grape hyacinth flowers at the bottom in a sort of mauve and then these very dark mauve bits that come up like this and uh, have little blobs on the end I don't know you need to talk to Richard because he's got the national collection <laughs> So he would tell you more about it. But I've seen it growing wild in olive groves in Mallorca and it is just fabulous. Such a lovely thing. And as mascara, I grow very late flowering. I think it's, I can't remember the date of the photo, but I think it would be May. Yeah. So that's that's yeah. definitely one I would like to grow, whether or not, I mean, is it is it tricky? I don't think so, no. I think it does like being in gravel. Probably it likes that sharp drainage. Do you have it, Alan? No, I don't. I've, I've just written it down. <laughs> I bet you have forgotten. And I've also also written in brackets, be generous with your purchase. <laughs> because you said it doesn't increase very much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a good note. Well, it looks amazing. So that's definitely one I would like. Though as I was looking for that photo, I also yeah. got stopped in my tracks by a picture you'd done of the poppy amazing grey, which I've already had as a flomo on this podcast. Yeah. Um, but you you taken a picture of it with another flomo of mine, which is the the Phloxstrum under the eye starry eye. Yeah. I've grown creme brulee for a few years now, but I've never grown starry eyes, and I've got it on my my list. I'm building at Chilton. Yeah. But the combination, oh, it was beautiful. Yeah, I thought so. I think I put on that post, I've died and gone to heaven because I thought it was fabulous. (laughs) I love it. So there's a whole load of FOMO really, but I put the mascara at the top. Um, So maybe Alan and I can can order it and uh, and plant it and think of you. What is your- How many would you like? I'm going to order it. How many would you like? (laughs) I've only got a little garden. (laughs) All right, turn her on on order for you then. (laughs) It is also available in white, but I don't think it's sort of very exciting in white. No. Yeah. Well, there's always that running joke. We all, for, for years now, when we've talked about plants, you'll always mention a plant and then someone will say, well, oh, there's the white form and it's very smart. <laughs> that is what they say about plumbago. There's a white form of plumbago. Yeah. But plumbago is such a lovely, light, pale, vibrant sort of blue. Why would you want a white one? Yeah, yeah. I was doing a plant store once and I had lots of pink lily of the valley and this lady came up and wanted to buy some. And I said, it's the pink one, it's really special. And she sort of said, why would I want it in pink? (laughs) I must admit, it is slightly knicker pink, as you call it, Alan, slightly dirty. And the scent is good. But at the time it was being sold for a lot of money by a nurseryman down in Suffolk. And, you know, it actually does better with me than the white. It's funny how you think, I mean, I think Lily, or thought Lily the Valley would never do for me here because I'm too dry, because they do like mm-hmm. quite moist and a fairly heavy soil. Um, our soil is light, fairly sandy. Um, and I planted it on the north side of a wall and it obliged me three years later becoming by emerging halfway across the path. It yeah. suddenly decided it did like me, but of course it had to go because it was in the path. Yeah, yeah. 
So, Jane Ann, what's your FLOMO? Uh, it's another one I've seen on Instagram this year. I would really like to grow Alcalthea Fruitessens Parker Freedom, which apparently it's a mallow hollyhock cross and it's rust resistant, which is all good because the rust on hollyhocks isn't great. Downside is it's five foot tall. So it's, I don't, do you grow it, Alan? Yes, I do. And, I, and I've actually, um, I think we had one or two left on the plant stand, which I filched because I, yeah. thought I, could, I could use it somewhere else again. But I'll tell you what, it's quite nice. It's because it's, because it is so tall, it's, it's often quite see-through. So yeah. you can actually place it fairly towards the front of a border and look through it. Ah, it's, it's, yes. it's, 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 it's gangly, admittedly. Um, yeah. And you, or you might want to grow it through shrubs to support the lower, the lower stems a little bit. Yes. Um, but it, as you say, it is so nice to have something that looks like a hollyhock um, without getting the rust. Yeah, that's right. Um, also, I my Coriolopsis has took and died. And um, mm. as you'll know, Alan, it's a lovely thing that flowers very early in the year and the bees yeah. get little sort of hanging bells, pale lemon. Mine was Coriolopsis porciflora. Yeah. And I think it was a combination of the very dry weather we had this year and possibly honey fungus. And it just suddenly died. Yeah. And then my other one, uh, which is going on the Chilton Seeds list or wherever else, is Cosmos Cupcakes, because they just make me smile every time I see them. <laughs> I agree with that. We had um, we had a self-sown plant of cupcakes in our um, Clematis Walk this year. And I mean, it, it's, there's something about the flower. I mean, it's, it, it reminds me of a jellyfish. Yes. Do you, can you see what I mean? A pulsating jellyfish yes. with that sort yes. of frilly edge to it. Um, yeah. And I, I just I just loved it. So I think cupcakes will be on my list too next year. <laughs> Aren't we? Did you grow <laughs> did, did it, bodies? No. no. I kind of try, I did Veluette this year. I try because I haven't got much space. So I kind of try a different cosmos. Um, so last year I did lemonade, which I did like, especially the ones that were a bit pinker, which probably a bit more like yeah. pink lemonade. And then this year I did Velouette, um, which was which was fine. I didn't grow it very well. I think I neglected it a bit. Um, yeah. So I think cupcakes will probably end up being now my cosmos for next year. It should be. I agree with you. It should be. It's just lovely. So, Alan, you've obviously written down a couple of new FLOMOs over the course of this podcast. But what was your original FLOMO when you came to the podcast party? <laughs> my original FLOMO for this um, programme or this episode was... Um, a climbing rose, which is the climbing rose of the year in uh, 2019. And it's a rose that's called Starlight Symphony. Um, and to describe it, it, it has large panicles of white, slightly tinted pink, slightly tinted cream, semi-double flowers. And the great beauty of those semi-double flowers is A, they're great for pollinators, and the bees absolutely love it, because they can get to these this nectar and the stamens and all the rest of it in the middle of it. And the other thing I, I love about it is the stamens, instead of just being a brash, bright, orangey yellow, they are yellow with a touch of pink. And if you look at it, it's, there's something that's remarkably demure and yet quite blousy about mm. it. And it's a combination <laughs> that, um, shall we say, intrigues. <laughs> Alan Gray liking something blousy. No. Never. <laughs> So anyway, but I just I'm just going to tell everybody because I ordered it from Cant's Roses, C A N T S, um, which is twelve ninety nine, and other places are selling it, and it's between sixteen and eighteen ninety nine. So you know, shop around, guys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we all know where to go now. <laughs> Actually, I I saw a rose at uh, Mannington this year. It was the first place I went after lockdown, and I went to see the Peter Beals Rose Garden. There was one called Pink Grutendorst. I don't know whether you know it, Alan. It's, oh, the, uh, with, with the pink edges just to the petals, yeah. like pinking shears. <laughs> Looks like a dianthus. It's a yeah. rose. And I thought I'd like to try that. There's a red Grutendorst as well as the pink one. Mm -hmm. um, but the great thing about those roses is that they don't suffer from black spot and all those ho other horrible rose diseases because yes. they are rugosa. And, and the rugosa roses, although you might not get the formality, you might not like the formality of the hybrid teas with their beautifully shaped petals and everything else, but you don't get the, that horrible disease that all the other roses get. Um, yes. they, they are, I think they're lovely plants. They grow very well by the seaside or in any exposed position, but they do like to be in full sun and with a reasonably light soil, not too heavy. Yeah, right. 
Give it yeah, a go. The last, the last episodes or all the episodes, I feel like I have got so many roses I want to grow now. My garden definitely needs to get bigger. Um, <laughs> there's a whole load of them. Right. Well, so we've got Flomo. Um, we've all got extra Flomo now after all of your wonderful plants, Jane Ann. Let's squeeze in one question before we have to wind things up. Um, Donald had been in touch. You can email us. You can comment on YouTube. You can get in touch on social media. Uh, email is hello at getgardeningnow.co.uk. Donald commented on YouTube wondering how and when should he prune his hebes, Alan? Well, I think hebes are some of the most amenable plants that you can grow in your garden because um, they do break from old wood, often quite willingly. Um, the one thing I would say about pruning hebes, if you've got a very, very old uh, hebe in your garden, you prune it very hard, you are more than likely to kill it because it says, oh, well, I wasn't expecting this. But if you've got a hebe that you prune a little and often every year, shall we say, you reduce it a little bit, it'd be much more willing to break from old wood. I think the thing is to know your hebe first before you start. If you've suddenly, if you've let your shrub bec become very old and very big, then I wouldn't trim it back by more than a third. I've got a, a variety of hebe called Simon Delow, which is a little bit of a tender one. It has um, dark green leaves, the most amazing red undersides to them. And it has these lovely sort of carmine spires of flowers and it's flowering now in the garden. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, but it does tend to suffer if it gets too too cold. Uh, in recent years, of course, it hasn't suffered at all. And where I've planted it, because it doesn't suffer, it grows too big. So I'm regularly having to trim it back. And each year I trim it and it's absolutely fine. But um, I think the thing to remember is, Beth Chateau used to say, right plant, right place, um, or right place, right plant, whatever it was. Um, you know, make sure that you know the dimensions of your hebe before you plant it. And hello, Lilibet, how are you? <laughs> just leapt onto my lap. Uh, Jane, Jane Ann, do you have any hebes that you would recommend? I don't grow any hebes at all, Thordis. Um, My understanding, though, in the past was that the bigger the leaf, the more tender. I don't know whether Alan would agree with that or whether definitely. that's the case. No, though. definitely. That, it, it, it is the case. And there was um, a period in the 70s, I think, probably into the uh, and 80s, where most of the hebes, they seemed to develop these fungal spots on their leaves. Um, and I think probably that was because, I mean, if you look at the construction of the way a, a hebe shoot grows, the leaves are like praying hands, sheltering that yeah. growth. Um, and so they're, they're very covered. And that means that they love windy places because that's be, this this praying hands has been you know um, developed to protect the emerging young shoots from the severe winds and I think in windy places they're absolutely fine but I think in uh, there was um, I can't remember the all oh, the weary weary there was a race of hebes developed in New Zealand called weary w-i-r-i and they are uh, um, less prone to this um, fungal disease but I think if you've got hebes and you plant them I mean they're really as tough as old boots with the current winters that we're having. But if you want to plant them, plant them where they get the wind. And talking about wind, don't worry, I'm not gonna be rude. <laughs> Hollyhocks, driving through one of the villages in North Norfolk, a coastal village, hollyhocks growing on the side of the road, literally on the verge, mm. being washed past by cars the whole time, and the wind stops them getting that rust. It dissipates uh -huh. them. I only, um, uh, I only have one hollyhock, and it's a fabulous double pink thing. Um, and it's right, I, I've got it in a, the windy, my front garden gets whipped by the wind. It's just there. And yeah, no rust at all. It loves it. Yeah. I tried planting yeah. sunflowers there. They all got blown over, but it was great yeah. for the hollyhock. And don't forget, if you've got room for a hebe, it's a great place for a hebe too. It's a real highlight of this podcast, Alan Gray's imitation of a hebe. I think I will, <laughs> I will forever remember that. Also, I have Weary Charm from you, Alan, and uh, it's, yeah. it's lovely. Um, Peter, my other half, picked it out from your plant sales area. Uh, yeah. So uh, that I see that thing. Well, if look, if he picked you, he's got taste, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and for more hebes, uh, I think it was episode 13 with Vanessa Scott of this podcast that we talked a bit about hebes. So if you find that podcast, all the plant lists on the Twitter and Instagram at Get Gardening Now, then you'll see a few more hebes if you're looking to plant one. Or you can be like Jane Ann Walton and be a hebe-free zone. <laughs> <laughs>
Jane Ann, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Continue to inspire us with your wonderful Instagram and all of your fabulous auriculars and snowdrops and everything else apart from heat. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Nice to see you. Bye-bye. Bye. Sorry, Alan. <laughs> I ejected you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Gonna have to get the Hoover out when this is over. <laughs> I love that Jane Ann keeps disappearing and we just sort of get an elbow. Yeah, dungarees, I thought it was a gardening apron. Both in the neck warmer zone, it's sort of that yeah, kind of... yes. For no other reason than it is a neck warmer, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. No, we don't want to hide our crinkly necks and chins. <laughs> no. This is the problem out of the window, Aim. <laughs> I'm green. Hey!